All right. Hello, my POS 201 students. Uh, this is your video lecture on Aristotle. Uh, I recommend you do the reading first because this lecture is intended to highlight some of the things from the reading that I, I want you to uh, uh, focus on, but uh, doesn't cover everything. And of course, we'll, we'll cover more uh, of this stuff in class, but this is sort of give you, you know, the main highlights. All right. So start off. Let's start talk about uh, Aristotle. His primary concern, primary field was ethics, uh, but he married together politics and ethics and thought politics should have sort of a uh, uh, an ethical end or ethical purpose. And that ethical purpose was um, achieving virtue. And a virtuous person is a good and happy individual. And so he wanted to, uh, you know, sort of the, he wanted to create uh, an ethical discipline to, that would help people achieve a good life, happiness, achieve a life of virtue. And politics, he felt, was closely tied to that end. Uh, so a happy person is, has a personality balanced between reason and desire. Um, so, uh, and moderation was the key to this. And he didn't think that material possession necessarily led to happiness um, or power. Uh, but you know it was virtue that led to happiness and, and the key to virtue is living a balanced life okay so the good life uh, you must incorporate virtue to make the human life complete uh, this was called the Aristotelian mean uh, and like I said it's a practical discipline to try to help human beings achieve this good life this life of virtue um, and you know it's something that you had to learn over time uh, sometimes you would delve too much into vices but the hope was that you would learn from those vices and it would steer you closer to virtue um, and virtue he thought lied between an excess of something or a deficiency for so for instance we'll use the example of courage uh, that's a virtue uh, it's your, how you respond to fear uh, on one end of the extreme uh, it would be rashness. So think of like a soldier um, going into combat for the first time. He might respond by being rash, kind of charging the battle without thinking, maybe nearly getting himself killed or getting some of his compatriots killed by his rash actions. That's a vice. On the other end of the spectrum, you have cowardice. First time the soldier goes into combat, uh, he runs away or he hides. Uh, again, an inappropriate uh, response to fear uh, and a vice. So courage is sort of that measured uh, response to fear where, you know, you're still able to use your reason, keep a cool head, and do what you're supposed to do. And, you know, it's, that's something that could be learned over time, um, but, you know, that was a virtue, and that's how you achieve virtue is finding that proper uh, middle between excess and deficiency. All right. So more, some more examples we have here. Um, let's say, you know, uh, desire for pleasure, food, drink, sex, drugs, you know, whatever. Excess of that, gluttony, and vice. Uh, it's not going to be good for you. Uh, deficiency, not you know, not at all enjoying uh, some of the good things in life. That leads to insensibility, also a vice. The key is to find the appropriate balance. You know, enjoy some of the you know. Uh, pleasures in life, but don't go to extreme of either end. You know, you don't want to be, you don't want to, you don't want to have no, you don't want to have uh, any fun, um, but you don't, you know, don't want to go to the other extreme either. Uh, other example: generosity lies between extravagance and stinginess, uh, truthfulness about oneself, or say, you know, self-esteem. Um, you know, you don't want to be arrogant and boastful, but neither do you want to be too self-deprecating or too hard on yourself. You have to find that appropriate balance, according to Aristotle. Uh, another key idea is the idea that man is a political animal. So because human beings were gifted with the power of speech and wisdom, or speech and reason, uh, and he also argued that man, man is an inherently sociable creature. It's natural for us to come together, form communities. In the case of the Greece, in the case of Greece, this was the the, the polis or the city-state. Um, so it's natural for us to come together and 
when we come together, we have to work out what is fair and unfair, what's just and unjust. We have a natural moral sense of good and evil, he argued. Uh, it's natural for us to come together and form associations. And so therefore, because we have to come together and work out what's just and unjust, man by nature is a political animal. And so kind of politics, it's kind of the idea that politics is in everything. Uh, whether you're negotiating or working out what's fair with your significant other, or you're working out what's fair uh, with your workmates, classmates, you know, whatever, or, you know, in the government, government realm. And, you know, I have a quote from him, Justice is the bond of men and states for the administration of justice, which is the determination of what is just, and this is the principal order of political society. So justice, ethical life, living a virtuous life, that's the end goal of us all coming together. Uh, and so one of the things um, Aristotle did was study different political systems. Greece at this time is divided up into about 158 uh, little uh, city-states. Uh, and Aristotle went out and he studied the different constitutions of those uh, city-states to try he's trying to determine what the best political system was, what the most practical one, what he felt would be the one that would, would lead to that good life or that virtuous life. Uh, and he divided them up first by structure. Uh, it was power held in the hands of one, the few, or the many. Um, and of course, virtue is the goal here. Um, and, you know, so contrast with Thomas Hobbes, who, you know, will be in one of my other video lectures, and we'll talk about him in class. Um, it's, society is not for mutual protection or prevention of crime or for the sake of commercial exchange. For him, it's all about virtue, uh, achieving that good life, life of happiness, and achieving justice. Um, while Hobbes, on the other hand, has a more stark view, he says, we come together for mutual protect protection to protect us from our own evil nature. Uh, and, you know, that's the that's, uh, basis of political realism, which we'll get into uh, later on. All right, so he further divided politics uh, or political systems according to how they were ruled. So you have the structure, one, few, many, and then how they were ruled. And so if they, if the rulership ruled with the common interest or the public good in mind, those were what he called the true forms of government. All right, um, and then so monarchy would be rule of the one, aristocracy would be rule of the few, and polity was rule of the many. Uh, and then on the other side here, you have if the rulers ruled in their selfish self-interest, those systems were defective, uh, they were perverted, uh, and were unjust systems because a good rule, good rulers need to look out for the common good, bad rulers only look out for themselves. So when you have that one bad guy, tyrant, one self-interested bastard, that's a tyrant, uh, maybe ruled by wealthy nobles. Uh, what do what are wealthy nobles going to do if they rule in their self-interest? Well, they're going to use their power and privilege to aggrandize more wealth to themselves, to themselves at the expense of everyone else. Uh, he also thought democracy was a, a perverted form of government because if you uh, give power to the many multitude, the commoners, and what are they going to do? They're going to use their power and position to take away wealth and titles uh, from the wealthy class and set themselves up as the new uh, wealthy class, and that was inherently unfair as well. All right. So democracy is the rule of the needy. The poor tyrannize the rich. On the other side, the oligarchs, the wealthy, tyrannize the poor and use their position to uh, further advance their wealth. Uh, and he thought both of those systems were inherently un unjust. Um, and so what we find then, therefore, is with the Greeks is the foundation for constitutional government. Um, which, you know, has an influence on our own republic. He argued uh, that wisdom can be found in the multitude. Uh, you know, if you have a collection of people with different virtues, you bring them together in association with each other, it's like, you know, it's like a banquet. Everyone brings a unique dish or a unique flavor to, to the banquet. Um, and the key he felt to achieving, you know, a virtuous society was balancing the multitude against the wealthy. And this ties directly into the birth of our own republic because 
Uh, James Madison, he wrote that the two most enduring factions within society is uh, the property owners versus the non-property owners. All right, and so it's the same thing as saying rich and poor. Um, and so you have to create a system, a balanced system that's going to balance the interests of the wealthy and balance the interests of the poor. So the wealthy have to have their ability to maintain their wealth and title and ha have it arbitrarily taken away. Uh, however, you can't uh, can't crap on the poor. Uh, they have to have means to gain titles and honors and wealth themselves. And so this is kind of what Aristotle envisioned and this influenced you know, people like James Madison who is considered one of the key architects of the American Constitution. And it's also kind of the birth of the idea of rule of law. Rule of law is uh, you know, standard written down rules that apply equally to everyone and are governed by reason, not by emotion, by whim, or anything like that. <clears throat> Alright, so the, now what he argues though is that the best state would be a monarchy. Um, monarchy uh, you know, it's the most efficient because you just have one ruler making all the decisions. Uh, and if you could find that one guy with preeminent virtue and political capacity um, that would look out for the common good, that would be the best system. However, he recognized, though, that that was impractical. Because of ostracism, the best are often exiled because of the jealousies of lesser men. So such a man would draw jealousy, people would try to undermine him. Uh, and so he felt that it was impractical to find that one uh, pre preeminent man that could sort of rule over and look to the common good. So, basically, you can't have what's ideal, you have to go with what's practical. And what he argued is the most practical system and the best one for achieving that balance and virtue that uh, Aristotle was concerned with was the constitutional polity. And that's the fusion of oligarchy and democracy unite the freedom of the poor and the wealth of the rich. So, um, like, I, like I just mentioned, you can't have uh, the wealthy uh, pooping on the poor, you can't have the poor taking away wealth and titles away from the rich. You have to create a system that balances both of their interests. And it's the same thing as virtue we just talked about. One extreme of society is the wealthy. The other extreme is the poor. So to achieve balance, you have to achieve some sort of moderation or middle point. And so, you know, he recognizes that uh, monarchy is not ideal, or that, you know, that one preeminent guy, that which is best, but also what is possible and what is easily attainable by all. So he's, he's again, trying to be practical, trying to find the best system that works. <clears throat> and so, if we're talking about virtue, the city should represent a virtuous soul. So if a virtuous soul is one that has dealt with excess and deficiency and achieved virtue, you can do the same thing with the polis or with the city or with the state. Um, life within the mean. So you, the mean between the rich and the poor is the middle class. Uh, they're best in the gifts of fortune because uh, you know they're, they're not overly extravagant. Uh, they're not poor. Uh, so he argued that the middle class was the virtuous class uh, and that the, the nobility they were unfit to rule, the poor are unfit to, unfit to rule, you need a large middle class to sort of uh, be the, uh, the foundation of uh, society. And this is actually congruent with modern political theory that argues in order to have a stable modern democracy, it needs to have a large middle class. And these are just, these are some things that are probably not as ap applicable uh, to today, but some things that Aristotle said. Uh, why he justified uh, why the middle class was best. Um, you know, he basically said the, the rich are spoiled brats, they don't know how to take orders, the poor are equally unfit because they don't know how to command, they've been, you know, downtrodden their whole life. Um, and so when the rich and poor are in, in disproportionate numbers, you have a city of masters and slaves, which each side despising the other. And so what you need is a city composed of more equals, uh, and so have a large middle class to balance out uh, the extremes of the poor and the wealthy. The wealth, the wealthy suffer from the vice of greed. The poor suffer from the vice of envy. Uh, and so you need that middle class to balance those interests. All right. And like I said, they're, they're congruent with modern democratic theory. Uh, maybe not for the same reasons as Aristotle stated, but there does seem to be a correlation with stable democracy and having a 